Today I'm going to talk to you about how scientists choose their research. If you are a principal investigator that's like a top tier scientist who's leading different research projects, they have some sort of main topic and focus. And if you are a younger scientist or if you are wanting to go into this field, deciding what to do can be super overwhelming. I know it was so overwhelming for me. I had no idea what direction I wanted to go in. It was a major struggle. So I'm here to talk to you today about different ways that you can um, get your research topics together, how scientists figure out and I'm also going to tell you what not to do. So many scientists give you this advice and it is the worst advice. So let's get into this episode and talk about how to form research. First, let's talk about the worst advice. And you will hear this so often and I will explain why it's terrible advice. People say all the time to choose your research based on your passion, to do something you love. I was told to do something that I wouldn't get sick of for five to seven years, something that I could work daily on and be passionate about it. And this was because I was doing my PhD, so that's why they said five to seven years. But here's the thing, your PhD pretty much sets you up for the kind of scientist you want to be, and it sets up your career trajectory for the rest of your life. Nobody told me that when you get your PhD, this is the research that you're carrying with you. So if you apply for a job in academia as a professor, this is what your lab is going to be based on. But even if you're going somewhere else, like I interviewed for jobs at zoos and museums, and this was the research that I was expected to continue on. So you better make sure that you like this research way beyond the five to seven years, but more importantly than that, you need to make sure that the research you're getting your, your degree in will get you the job that you want. And my big problem was I didn't know what job I wanted. I had some vague idea. I was like, maybe I'll work in nonprofits, maybe I'll work in the government. When I see the job, I will know it. But here's the thing. It is too competitive out there nowadays to do that. You can't do that anymore. You need to focus in and narrow in on what you want to do as best as you can and then get the experience that sets you up for that job. If you're getting a master's, you can be a little bit more lenient. It doesn't pigeonhole you as much, but PhD, it for sure does. I was told a PhD is a very flexible degree. It shows that you can problem solve. It can work in um, lots of different areas. That is not true for our field. I was overqualified with a PhD for lots of jobs. I got my PhD in um, using genetics, non-invasive genetics, to study forest elephants, and people saw me either as a geneticist or an elephant biologist. And the only jobs that I got were jobs that had one of those elements. It was I couldn't I couldn't transfer into a, a job, let's say, studying bears. Um, it was it was really hard to do that. I had to, you had to be. You have to be specialized. You have to be experienced in that area to get that kind of job. So think long term. Think about think about where you want to live, what you want your life to look like. I love my PhD topic so much. I love studying elephants, but I really didn't see myself living um, abroad in Africa forever or in Asia forever. And I didn't consider that. I didn't look at the jobs ahead of time and that's where most of those jobs are. If you wanna work in a nonprofit, you for sure have to do that. There's very few jobs in research in the United States to work on a species like an elephant and stay in the US. You would either have to be a professor, work for a zoo, and those jobs are pretty rare and um, infrequent. Okay. So there's my spiel, there's my rant about, about do the work. Make sure you go to my website, fancyscientist.com, and search for the job tracker. Just type it in the search bar. I'll put the link in the show notes too. But start studying the jobs now so you make sure you get the skills, experience, and education you need to land your dream job. 
Okay, so the way that people go about structuring their research is I would say three different main ways. The first one is what people think of the most often, and I would say this tends to be the most uncommon. I'm not going to say rare, but uncommon nowadays. I think this is what it this is more like what it used to be decades ago, but it's veering away from that. But um this so so in this way, this first way scientists choose a species or a taxa or they choose a system, like an ecosystem or, or um, a certain habitat type, and they kind of base all of their research around that. So for example, when I was in graduate school, the lab next door to us, they studied birds. Um, and I mean, they specialize more in songbirds, but um, students were doing different ecological projects revolved around birds. Some were studying bird um, like movement patterns, some were studying mating success, reproductive success. Um, but again, the, the, main, the main topic was birds. So students in that lab or were interested in joining that lab, they could, they could, um, they could study different things. Um, there were students working in Peru on understanding the altitudinal migration of birds. There were students in Missouri study, studying the birds um, just locally. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. And down the hall from us, there was another lab that, um, that focused on amphibians. Um, so they, again, had all different sorts of study species, you know, salamanders, um, different frogs, different types of questions. Some had more behavioral questions. Some had more ecological questions or population dynamic questions, habitat questions. Um, but the focus was mostly on amphibians. Some snakes too, so herp, herp work, but mostly amphibians. And then in terms of a system, there are professors that focus more on different ecosystems or um, different, yeah, different ecosystems or even, even specific locations too. So um, Dan Rubenstein out at Impala or at um, Princeton University, he focuses a lot of his research on Impala, which is a field, which is a field station there. So his work revolves a lot around um, understanding decision making in animals, and he does a lot of research in equids, especially the Grevy's zebra. But really, he has students working on all different sorts of questions in the Impala, Impala ecosystem. Um, he does have students elsewhere too doing other kinds of questions, but um, you know he'll have like more the decision making questions on animals there and then he'll also have like understanding some of the more like landscape level habitat questions of um, like like the human dimensions aspects of the different of the habitats um, and the species of the human dimensions aspects affecting the different habitats and the species living there that's what I was trying to say so that again is like I would say the most uncommon way nowadays or it's veering away from that but there's nothing wrong with that um, that's one way to set up your research is to pick like like something you're really interested in so for me it would have been like elephants and then study different aspects of elephants um, I was especially interested in their social behavior another approach you can use is being driven by the question or a topic so um, an example of this is like, say you are really interested in predator-prey interactions. Then you could have students studying predator-prey systems all over the world with different species. It wouldn't necessarily matter what they are. Seed dispersal. You could have um, people studying here in North Carolina, studying squirrels, or you could have people studying elephants in Gabon. It's still understanding the same ecological um, principles, the same um, types of questions, just different species, different um, study systems. Human wildlife conflict. An example um, that comes to me where you can work on really different species is with human cognition, or sorry, not human cognition, animal cognition. There's a lot of really sophisticated um, species that have um, a lot of really complex social systems. So for example, elephants, apes, um, and marine mammals. So those are very different um, habitats and environments, but you can have somebody who studies very similar or the same topic across those things. 
So someone who comes to mind is um, Brian Hare at Duke. He studies um, he studies animal cognition. So he studies um, bonobos in um, the um, um, in Central Africa, and then he also studies um, uh, dogs. Actually, dog cogn cognition as well. So you can study, you can be driven by like a major topic or um, or a question, some sort of question that you are interested in that can work across different species. And then the final way that people tend to um, study things is by specializing in a, in a particular skill. So in this case, it doesn't really matter what species you're studying or what system you're studying because the skill can apply to different things. So for example, my advisor, her research focused on non-invasive genetics. So we had all different types of projects going in on in our lab. We had somebody like me who is using genetics to understand the social structure of elephants. We had other people who were using um, non-invasive genetics to estimate different population sizes of animals from, from um, river otters to hellbender salamanders to horses. Um, we had all different types of animal species that we were working on. So genetics can apply to a lot of different questions. Now we're working more towards genomics, um, but you can easily switch to different systems. Um, usually, again, I would say it's easier to stay within your system, but I have a friend um, in genomics who has worked on um, lots of different animals, um, from bears, rats, chipmunks, so it translates well. Other examples of this are camera traps. You can you can specialize in, in doing camera trap work and therefore your research can easily move to different species, to different systems. Often with camera traps, you're dealing with occupancy modeling that works for all different types of species as well. Um, another example that comes to mind is satellite telemetry. Um, so if you become really great at analyzing satellite data, with satellite data we're getting so many location points now. Um, the technology is so great that um, it's really a quantitative skill. So if you are good at doing that, again, it doesn't matter if you're studying egrets or manatees <laughs> or sea turtles. The principles that you learn will translate across those different um, species and ecosystems. So again, when you're thinking about your research project, really think with the end in mind. Like really think, like where, where do you want to live? I know that sounds so silly and like so like, um, not that important, like we should be driven by, um, you know, more like like our curiosity, but this stuff really matters. Like think about where you're going to be happy. If you are going to be happy in a warmer environment or if you love the sea, like, I mean, then do something that involves marine ecosystems or coastal ecosystems. Um, don't just do something to get a degree. Really think about what it is you want to do. But ultimately, think about if you are driven by your passion, if you want to do research and what you're passionate about, make sure that there is a job in it. That is super duper important. If you want to work on snow leopards, and what kind of job can you get in working on snow leopards? Um, there's zoo jobs, of course, but are you going to have to move to Asia? And is that something you're willing to do? For some people, yes, but do you want to do that for the rest of your life? Really, really think about this. Use the job tracker, go download it, and use it to your advantage to understand what the jobs are now. One thing I should say though, if you want to go into academia to be a professor, you have more leverage. You can choose your study system and you can be more flexible. You can be a professor and you can do your field work in another country um, or just far away in the United States and don't have to um, 
worry as much about moving to that place. So for example, at our university in um, Missouri, we had a group that had their field work in an alpine uh, field station in Colorado. So that professor would spend their summers in Colorado and be in Missouri for the rest of the year. Same thing with Dan Rubenstein. I know he spends summers frequently in Kenya, around Impala, and then he's at Princeton at the, run, at the rest of the time. So if you are um, interested in becoming a professor, then you can be a little bit more flexible. I should have added that caveat in there. So I hope this really helped in um, figuring out what you are interested in research-wise, how to, how to formulate different research questions. I highly recommend reading the literature. That's also really great to help you understand what your interests are. But again, really think far down the line. Where do you wanna see yourself? Honestly, 20 years from now, what kind of job do you wanna have? And I'm running out of batteries on my camera. We're all done with this episode. It was a short one, but it was a good one. Okay, see you guys next time, bye.